me into a room and pitched me and like I knew right away, hey, here's this big effort that Facebook is doing. It's very ambitious. We have this mission of financial inclusion that I immediately identified with. They brought me in as the programming languages expert. And this is was sort of my road into, into blockchain. I spent a number of years at Facebook uh, looking at code. And so I developed a lot of opinions about software safety, about programming language design, seeing where programming languages set programmers up for failure and where it helped them. The most scarce resource in the world isn't time and it's not money but it's human brain power. And like a lot of what human brain power is being used to do is to build software. And so if you can magnify brain power, do more per unit time, then like that's one of the most impactful things that you can do. I did my homework in terms of looking at other options. And basically the decision of to create a new language came from the fact that we didn't think any of these options was quite appropriate. There are some really essential tasks that a smart contract language needs to do that don't exist in conventional languages. And so that was a lot of the, the basis why we decided to, to do something new. The company started in November 2021, so definitely something I remember was a uh, hacking on uh, on Sui on Christmas Day and getting the first uh, end-to-end -end transaction that was calling Move Code uh, going all the way through and working. We started off with just being able to do object transfers, which happened outside of Move, but that was the first time we had a Move call that worked all the way through. Uh, that was pretty cool. That was a huge milestone because you know it's the first public distributed network running Sui. This is the first time where we can really establish that developer feedback loop because now we have a live network. People can publish code. People can use our CLI, they can use our SDKs, we can get feedback. You see someone doing something with the language that you hadn't thought about, or you see the, someone discovering it for the first time and saying, like, this thing is really cool. Uh, at that point, I think it, feel, it feels really good, and I feel a lot, of, a lot of pride to see, like, your life's work and sort of your intellectual baby uh, taking, out, taking on a life of its own and uh, growing up a little bit. Programming languages, they're not like natural languages. They don't do everything. They're supposed to do one particular kind of task and do that task really well. The reason a dedicated language is required for this is because these are tasks that are not supported in conventional programming languages. There are three unique differentiating features of Move on Sui. So the first one is the object-based data model. Objects are the fundamental building blocks uh, in Sui Move. It's just a big database of objects. And the kind of task that Move is targeted at is programming with scarce objects, objects that have conservation properties like, oh, you can't accidentally throw them away. You can't copy them. Uh, they have strong ownership transfer. And so with Sui, like, you get all of these things basically for free. Like Defining an object is as easy as you define a struct. It has some fields. It has a globally unique ID, so you have a way to refer to it from your inside of move code in the front end. This ID stays the same as the object moves across accounts and travels across time. It gives you a, a way to always refer to it. And it's not something that the programmer has to do. It's just like every object gets one of these for free. The first change we made when we came out of Libra was to add this object-based data model. The second feature that I think is really, um, that is really interesting is something called programmable transaction blocks. When you have a transaction, it calls a move function and that's sort of uh, all that it does. And what programmable transaction blocks let you do is, instead of just calling one function, you call a function, and then you call another function. You can pass objects from earlier in the transaction block into functions later in the transaction block. Uh, it lets you do composability on the fly uh, from the front end. And so this is probably the favorite feature of Sui Builders because it just lets them do so much more than they could if you can call only one function at a time. The third big differentiator is something called dynamic fields, where with move objects, of course, you declare a set of fields, static types, you you write to them, you can update them. 
But what dynamic fields do is they let you add additional data to a move object on the fly. Maybe you publish an object and then you decide later, I'd actually like to add this other field to it that I didn't anticipate needing at the beginning, but without having to rewrite my old code or migrate the old um, migrate the old object data. You can mix and match objects in ways that maybe the original creator didn't uh, didn't intend and like create these mashup experiences that are really delightful. So like for game developers, I think the dynamic fields is the one of the features that they find the most compelling. Say you have um, a character in a game and they've got an inventory that consists of all these heterogeneous types of objects. The way you would express that in SWE is that the, the hero character is an object and then you know maybe their their sword is a is another object and it's connected to the hero via a dynamic field that says hey here's what I'm holding in my hand and then you know if they have some boots there's another dynamic field that says here's what's on my feet you don't have to know in advance that this is what's going to be needed you have a lot of flexibility in how you can mix and match things um, and there's been some really impressive stuff that sweet builders have done combining these features to give you a lot more richness and power been pumped about seeing what our builders do, like leveraging SWE in ways that we didn't expect, figuring out how to combine features in creative ways. We really care about making SWE the place where the best builders build. There's the new transfer to object feature. I want to see what folks are going to do with the random beacon. I would like to see with some of the extensions we're making to ZK login that allow you to do multi-sig accounts. Uh, that incorporates ZK Login as one of the authentication features. I'm constantly surprised and delighted by what the Sweet community creates, and I'm really excited what you all are going to do in this hackathon. I am the creator of Move. I'm the first person to join the Libra project and be given the assignment of, hey, Libra is going to have smart contracts. Uh, it's important to have safe programmability on the blockchain, like figure out what to do with that. Someone pulled me into a room and pitched me and like I knew right away, hey, here's this big effort that Facebook is doing. It's very ambitious. We have this mission of financial inclusion that I immediately identified with. They brought me in as the programming languages expert. And this is was sort of my road into, into blockchain. I spent a number of years at Facebook uh, looking at code. And so I developed a lot of opinions about software safety, about programming language design, seeing where programming languages set programmers up for failure and where it helped them. The most scarce resource in the world isn't time and it's not money, but it's human brain power. And like a lot of what human brain power is being used to do is to build software. And so if you can magnify brain power, do more per unit time, then like that's one of the most impactful things that you can do. I did my homework in terms of looking at other options. And basically the decision of to create a new language came from the fact that we didn't think any of these options was quite appropriate. There are some really essential tasks that a smart contract language needs to do that don't exist in conventional languages. And so that was a lot of the, the basis why we decided to, to do something new. 
the company started in November 2021, so definitely it's something I remember was a uh, hacking on uh, on Sui on Christmas Day and getting the first uh, end-to-end transaction that was calling Move Code uh, going all the way through and working. We started off with just being able to do object transfers, which happened outside of Move, but that was the first time we had a Move call that worked all the way through. Uh, that was pretty cool. That was a huge milestone because you know it's the first public distributed network running Sui. This is the first time where we can really establish that developer feedback loop because now we have a live network. People can publish code. People can use our CLI, they can use our SDKs, we can get feedback. You see someone doing something with the language that you hadn't thought about, or you see them someone discovering it for the first time and saying, like, this thing is really cool. Uh, at that point, I think it feel it feels really good. And I feel a lot of a lot of pride to see like your life's work and sort of your intellectual baby uh, taking out taking on a life of its own and uh growing up a little bit. Programming languages, they're not like natural languages. They don't do everything. They're supposed to do one particular kind of task and do that task really well. The reason a dedicated language is required for this is because these are tasks that are not supported in conventional programming languages. There are three unique differentiating features of Move on Sui. So the first one is the object-based data model. Objects are the fundamental building blocks uh, in Sui Move. It's just a big database of objects. And the kind of task that Move is targeted at is programming with scarce objects, objects that have conservation properties like, oh, you can't accidentally throw them away. You can't copy them. Uh, they have strong ownership transfer. And so with Sui, like, you get all of these things basically for free. Like Defining an object is as easy as you define a struct. It has some fields. It has a globally unique ID, so you have a way to refer to it from your inside of move code in the front end. This ID stays the same as the object moves across accounts and travels across time. It gives you a, a way to always refer to it. And it's not something that the programmer has to do. It's just like every object gets one of these for free. The first change we made when we came out of Libra was to add this object-based data model. The second feature that I think is really, um, that is really interesting is something called programmable transaction blocks. When you have a transaction, it calls a move function and that's sort of uh, all that it does. And what programmable transaction blocks let you do is, instead of just calling one function, you call a function, and then you call another function. You can pass objects from earlier in the transaction block into functions later in the transaction block. Uh, it lets you do composability on the fly uh, from the front end. And so this is probably the favorite feature of Sui Builders because it just lets them do so much more than they could if you can call only one function at a time. The third big differentiator is something called dynamic fields, where with move objects, of course, you declare a set of fields, static types, you, you write to them, you can update them. But what dynamic fields do is they let you add additional data to a move object on the fly. Maybe you publish an object and then you decide later, I'd actually like to add this other field to it that I didn't anticipate needing at the beginning, but without having to rewrite my old code or migrate the old, uh, migrate the old object data. You can mix and match objects in ways that maybe the original creator didn't uh, didn't intend and like create these mashup experiences that are really delightful. So like for game developers, I think the dynamic fields is the one of the features that they find the most compelling. Say you have um, a character in a game and they've got an inventory that consists of all these heterogeneous types of objects. The way you would express that in Sui is that the the hero character is an object and then, you know, maybe their their sword is a is another object and it's connected to the hero via a dynamic field that says, "Hey, here's what I'm holding in my hand." 
And then, you know, if they have some boots, there's another dynamic field that says, here's what's on my feet. You don't have to know in advance that this is what's going to be needed. You have a lot of flexibility in how you can mix and match things. Um, and there's been some really impressive stuff that Sweet Builders have done combining these features to give you a lot more richness and power. pumped about seeing what our builders do, like leveraging SWE in ways that we didn't expect, figuring out how to combine features in creative ways. We really care about making SWE the place where the best builders build. There's the new transfer to object feature. I want to see what folks are going to do with the random beacon. I would like to see with some of the extensions that we're making to ZK login that allow you to do multi-sig accounts. Um, that incorporates ZK Login as one of the authentication features. I'm constantly surprised and delighted by what the Sweet community creates, and I'm really excited what you all are going to do in this hackathon. I am the creator of Move. I'm the first person to join the Libra project and be given the assignment of, hey, Libra is going to have smart contracts. Uh, it's important to have safe programmability on the blockchain, like figure out what to do with that. Someone pulled me into a room and pitched me and like I knew right away, hey, here's this big effort that Facebook is doing. It's very ambitious. We have this mission of financial inclusion that I immediately identified with. They brought me in as the programming languages expert. And this is was sort of my road into, into blockchain. I spent a number of years Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of uh, the Road to Overflow uh, workshop. So today we'll be having Menos helping us uh, working through an end-to-end -end example of a token swap that we have <clears throat> also pretty much uh, fully documented on our website. But it will also be good to uh, for everyone to see how we will build it in real time. So uh, without further, further ado, let me introduce Menos and uh, he will show you guys how to actually build a token swap. Hey Z, hey everyone, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, if you can hear us, uh, please type below I... in the chat. Awesome, let's make sure everyone can hear me first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, type one in chat if you can hear us. Let's yep. also assume. All right, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to remove myself. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Manos. Awesome. Awesome. So, hey, everyone. I'm Manos. I'm a software engineer at Mist and Labs. And in this presentation, we're going to see how we can build a trading demo. It's a swap. We named it token swap, but that also applies to any other asset. Um, the goal of this is that we want to swap an object or an asset. Uh, can you, you share may your screen? Saying can asset. You um, share the screen I will. I'm doing just an introduction and then. I will All right. Start. Okay.
<laughs> so the idea overall is you will hear me saying assets and objects interchangeably. You can think of them as the same thing on three because everything on three is an object. And um, what we want to build is a trading app. So we will build it in a way that's trustless so that we can avoid trusting any third parties. Uh, we don't want to trust a third party to actually do the swap for us. Of course, we cannot trust each other. Um, I mean, of course, it's a strong word. We can trust each other in some cases, but in this scenario, we won't. Um, we want to make sure that um, the state of the assets cannot change throughout this process. So when we actually lock them in our smart contracts, they will not be able to mutate themselves. So we can imagine some scenarios where, where, where the assets get mutated and they lose the initial value that we expected. And at any time and at any point, um, either of the parties can actually choose to go back and cancel the trade, of course, as long as it hasn't been completed. So let me share my screen and I hope you can see my screen right now. I have no visibility on that. <laughs> so the design we will follow for that is the following. Let's assume a scenario where I wanna trade my copy. I, if you're not familiar with what the copy is, it's the Swift French project. And I have a copy and I wanna trade it for a bull circle or any bull circle. What I can do is that I can lock my copy in an object and get back my key as we can see on the first part here. So I lock it in a locked object and then I get back my key. That key allows me to actually get back my copy in case I wanna abort this whole operation. And then the other party who wants to give me the bull shark for my, for this particular copy can actually create an escrow. An escrow would be an object that holds the bull shark in it and can only be opened, can only be finalized with my own copy, with the locked object I created. And um, so this is pretty much what we're trying to build in this workshop. Then an extra thing we will do is actually build an, index, an indexing service so that we can actually browse all the locked objects. Um, and we can also easily keep a mapping between a locked object and their keys we will be able to easily find escrows that are proposed to my address at any point, And we will try to expose some public APIs for all the data. But let's begin with the smart contract. Before I start, I want to raise that um, this entire demo is also part of our documentation. And let me actually, show you this um so here in the documentation you can actually find the entire code base of what we're doing um let me share the link i realized that i haven't shared the screen that i wanted to show so <laughs> let me fix the presentation i will actually share my tires screen right um i hope now you can see it so this is the part of the documentation that actually has the entire code base and if we follow the link here we can also see the source code that we will build and before i even start writing code i want to show you the final result what would be our ideal goal on what we're building throughout this workshop so here we see that we have a dashboard where I can see the owned objects I have, and I can actually choose to lock them. This is part of the first phase we discussed. So here, if we go back to the diagram, we see that I have my objects and I can lock them into a locked object. So here I can choose to lock items. Let's say that I'm locking this happy bear. It's executed and locked. And here I can see all my locked objects. So these objects, because I own them, I can unlock them at any, in any point in time. 
So I can choose to unlock if I want to. But the goal of the locking is that we actually want to do escrows. Here, we can see that we can browse through the system's locked objects, every object that has been locked in the system. And we can actually choose to start an escrow. This is that part that we talked about. So I can browse through locked objects and I can propose an asset in return for a particular asset. So if we go back to the demo for here, we can say that I will offer this Sweeness name to get that um, bear. Then I can create the escrow. And we can see on the pending request that I'm offering this Sweeness name and I will get this happy bear if the escrow is accepted by the other party. Now, that was a quick demo on what we're building. So let's actually start writing the code for it. We will start by writing these smart contracts. Let me create a directory. And we can start a new contract by doing sweet move new and let's name it escrow. Let me now open this on my VS code. Can I get the confirmation that I've shared the screen properly and you can see my VS code? Uh, yep, I can see it from my side at least and also on the YouTube. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, thank you. So now, as we said on the design document before, we will create the locked module and we have the escrow. So let me create a module which is called lock.move. Now, the first goal is we want to create a type, a struct, an object that will actually um, wrap our object so we cannot change it, but also give us the ability to get it back if we want to, so we can unwrap the locked object. Let's create a struct for that. Let's name it locked. Let's assume that it has key and store, so it can be created. And let's also create an ID for that, but we also we always need an ID for an object um, that is transferable. And now, in this phase, we, might, we said that we want to wrap an object in it. And there is more than one way we can do it. We could, for instance, say that the object here is a T, so the swap can work and the locked struct can hold any kind of objects here. Or... Uh, sorry to interrupt, Manos here. Uh, yep. Can you increase the font size a little bit? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Is that better? Yep. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I was saying that um, we want to wrap the object inside another object. And there are multiple ways we can do it. We can wrap it as is right here, or we will we can do it a different way, which I will explain in a little bit. Another object that we we'll need is a key. So we can open this lock. Again, we can create a struct with the name key. And we also need a way to make sure that a key only works for a particular lock. So here we would have two ways we can do it. We can either add, we can use the ID pointer pattern where we point the ID that an object works for and we actually check on our smart contract functions whether the right ID corresponds to the objects I'm seeing when I receive them. We will see it in a little bit. Let's also keep it like that. Let's say that for a locked, in order to unlock it, you have to pass in a key with a particular ID. Now, let's create a public facing function. That gets an object. Of type T that can be any kind of object. And let's say that this will actually return a locked object that will be the wrapper of that object we're passing in and the key for it 
So we can use it and we can use that key to either finalize an escrow or we can use that key to actually unlock it back and get back the original object. Now let's create a key. The ID, we create a new ID like this. And let's also create the locked object. Let's create a new ID. Let's say that the key is actually the ID of the key object that um, we created. That's actually our check that the key, the key object that we're creating will work for that particular locked object. That's the capability pattern. And we can then return the lock and we can return the key. The way, the reason why we are actually returning this instead of um, transferring it directly. Oh yeah, and we also forgot to wrap the object. Let's assume that we do it like that. There we go. We don't need the mutable. All right, so the reason we're actually returning instead of doing direct transfers is that we want to allow composability. Um, you, you've probably heard already about programmable transaction blocks. And the idea is that instead of doing a direct transfer, which cannot be used in a single transaction, we can say that we return the, the key back and then the sender can actually choose. Do I want to transfer it to a different address? Do I want to use it directly for an escrow or any other uh, smart contract call? That way we can create pretty complex and pretty um, composable transactions throughout the network. And we can see the interoperability that we can have between different smart contracts. So that was the one way that we would actually wrap the object, but I will actually choose to, deal, to do it a little bit differently. And the reason is that the way we have actually stored it right now, we will lose access to the display standard because we do not do indexing for wrapped objects right now. So in order to preserve the display standard, the display standard is um, our standard for explorers and wallets to display an image, uh, a title, and different metadata for objects. And if we actually wrap it, we will not be able to retrieve it from the RPCs. So now I will actually use a different method, which is adding it as a dynamic object field. So instead of having the object right here, we will make this parameter phantom. And we want key and store. Um, because we cannot actually store an object if it doesn't have um, store. I will remove it from here. And I will actually add it as a dynamic object field. Now, in order to create this dynamic object field, we also need a key because dynamic fields overall work like a key value pair. So let's create a private struct. Every struct is private to its module. Let's uh, name it um, locked object key. So here, when we actually add the dynamic object field, we can use this as the key. And we can add the object as the value. And if I correct my misspellings, and I actually add mutable because we are actually we want to use this object mutably after we create it our lock function will work. Now, if we called it, we would, for instance, wrap or copy object into another object, which has control over that. We cannot mutate it right now because it's right under this object. And the only things we can do with that object after that is whatever this contract allows us to do. Right now, it doesn't allow us to do anything, but 
let's actually fix that. Let's actually add an unlock function. For this unlock function, we will need a locked object of type T, and we will need the key. And that will actually give us back the object that we wrapped in it. Now, remember I said before that we want to make sure that the key is the correct key for that particular object. This is the perfect time to actually do this check. We want to make sure that the locked object key is equal to the ID of the key. Otherwise, we need to error because we are trying to unlock a locked object with the wrong key. Now we can actually destructure it, delete the key. We can get the object from the dynamic fields. We can remove the dynamic field right now because we want to get the object back. We can also destroy the locked object because we don't need it anymore. That was the wrapper that was holding our, own, our copy. And we can return it. So what we essentially did here is that we got the locked object and its key. We got them by value because we actually want to destroy them. And that will also give us the gas rebates as we destroy them. Then we check that this is the correct um, key for that particular object. We destroyed the key because we don't need it anymore. Then we removed the object that we had wrapped before uh, from the dynamic fields. Then we destroyed uh, the wrapper object as well, and then we returned that object. So I think that's pretty much all we need for the locker at least to begin with. We will actually come back and revisit that as we might want to add a few um, events here to help with our indexing. But let's do it like a little bit later. All right, so we now have the logged objects. Let's go and create the escrow. I will actually name it shared because that's how our demo has it named. And I actually want us to try this with our existing setup. Let me see if we have any questions. No, we don't. All right. So now, if we go back to the original diagram, we see that we want to create, we created already the first part, which is locking the object. And now we're going to move and create the second part, which is the escrow. So now let's define our escrow model. Again, let's use the same ideas before on how we actually hold the object in the escrow. Let's give it a UID. Let's also add the sender and an intended recipient for this escrow. We might want to do it for regulatory reasons. And now we will add the secondary party object in this escrow. So in order for us to actually be able to do this, we also need to know for which locked object we want this escrow to be valid. That way we are reassured that the object that can unlock this escrow and actually complete the trade, the trust trade here, is um, the one we wanted to. So again, we use the ID pointer to accomplish that. So this exchange key would actually be the ID of the key that opens the locked object we want to trade. All right, so do we have any questions before I continue?
I will assume no and actually continue. So now we want to create an escrow. Of course, we need the object, the escrowed object. We need the exchange key that we want to exchange our object for. We want the recipient. We can assume that we did it for regulatory reasons. It's not a necessity here. And now we can create a new escrow object. So here again, we would need to create a new ID. Let's assume that the sender is the one that sent this transaction. We will use the recipient as is, as well as the exchange key. So now we have an object with which we will actually share that will wrap our own object. So in this design, that will wrap our bull shark. It has the intended recipient and it also has the intended exchange key. So only someone who holds the key with that particular ID can go in and complete the escrow. Now, let's also hold our object in the escrow. Again, let's also create another, uh, another key for our key value on the dynamic object fields. So now we have saved the object and the last step would be for us to share the object, to share the escrow object. The moment we share it, um, that means that anyone can use that object to build transactions. So anyone holding the particular exchange key can come in and complete the exchange. Let's also import the dynamic object field. So this is the first part. Now we can do this step here, which is that I want to put my bullshark on escrow and I only want to get this particular copy for it. Now let's create these arrows over here, which is finalizing an escrow only with a specified locked object. For that, we can create a public function. Let's name it swap. Here we have two type parameters because we have the we have two different assets. These parameters could be the same, uh, but they could also not be the same. For instance, in our case, this the first T would be the copy, and the U would be the bullshark or the other way around. So, as params in this swap, we would need the escrow, of course, that we created. We would need a key. We don't have the key defined here, so we also need to import it from the other module. Let's also import all the other um, struct types as well because we will need them. Then we will need the locked object, the context. So here, in this case, when we build the swap function, there are a few checks we need to do. First, we need to check that the key that we are actually supplying is the same key that the escrow was created for. So let's actually go ahead and do that. Let's check that the escrow exchange key Otherwise, abort. One extra note that I forgot to mention earlier is that generally it's a better idea for our abort codes to be built differently, but I won't show it right now. We can use different names for our abort codes instead of having 
integers that will help us with our testing. Now, we can see that the escrow exchange key is the same as the, ob as the key that we received here. Otherwise, this function called would abort. Now, let's remove the escrow object. Let's add the type parameter. That's the escrow object. In our example, I ended up making T, the bull circle, and U, the copy. So here. Now, another thing we can do, in the past, we couldn't actually destroy shared objects, but quite recently, we have the ability to also destroy shared object. Escrow was a shared object, as we've seen from the previous implementation, and we can actually distract it now and destroy it so we can get back the gas rebates. So let's distract all the different um, fields that it has. Let's do immutable. Actually, no, never mind. Let me do that before I distraction. it. And now I have destroyed that. Now, another thing that we needed to check, and I actually didn't, was that we wanted the, the escrow recipient to be the one that actually does the swap. So. Let me also add that in the beginning. Again, that could be for regulatory reasons or any other reasons who might want specific addresses. This is just a sample, so we move with, we move with that. And um, now, since we've done all the checks, what we can do is we can transfer, we can unlock the locked object. In that case, that was the copy. So we can call the unlock using the key. And we can transfer it to the sender. Then we can actually delete the ID of that object, which means the shared object deletion. And we can return the escrowed object. So in this case, when we actually unlocked the copy before we transferred it to the sender, um, and we then the escrow object, which is the bull shark. So in that case, we can actually complete the trustless swap. And that's that pretty much finishes the entire flow here. We have the locked object. Um, we have a locked object that we lock something in it. We have an escrow, which is intending to be used only from uh, that for that particular locked object and we can do a swap between them without having to trust a third party we can do it for any kind of assets as long as they have the key and store abilities and i would say that the only thing we're missing right now is making sure that we can also get our object back from the escrow and i will actually copy and paste that so we save a little bit of time I don't care about the error codes now, but if we actually wanted to see how we would build error codes better, the idea here is that we would create um, a constant with a name so we can have better understanding of what the error is about. For instance, here, that could be that um, this is like a, an error in valid exchange key. So now we could go up here and 
define error codes like that. This is the best practice we have in today's world when writing move. And we would continue to do it for all the different other errors. You can see the full list of the errors in the actual uh, live code base. So now we also, I also pasted the return to sender because there is, I think that by now we have a little bit of an understanding of why we're doing that. Um, and that kind of wraps up our core functionality, but also gives us like a great step towards the second part of this flow, which is how we would build indexing for that particular solution. Now that we have all of that and it can be called by everyone, it's time for us to think about our indexing. So for this particular demo, uh, we will go ahead and add a few events that we can later track with our own custom indexers. How we build indexing is not um, black and white. There are different ways we can build our own indexing service depending on the scenario. And actually, sorry, but before jumping into that, is there any question on what we've done so far? Uh, I think there was one question about, <clears throat> Is this effectively how you build an NFT marketplace with the extra example? Uh, of course, they would have a, a a price element, I would assume. Yeah, so generally for marketplaces, we have the kiosk standard, which is the commerce framework on SWE. And um, because they're other things involved with trading like royalties and making sure that nobody can skip royalties. Um, I would possibly use this for swaps and not as much for marketplaces. For marketplaces, I would use Kiosk and the marketplace adapter that's um, coming up really, I think it's already out, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, that would be kind of a different story. I right. hope that answers it yeah i think the I overall agree. goals yeah go, go ahead go ahead <laughs> i wanted to say that the overall overall goal here is to show a little bit of movement how we would um index stuff and less about like actual um use cases and actual usability of the code we're seeing right so uh there there was a workshop yesterday on kiosk uh with Although with, with some technical difficulties there, of course, but uh, the the code base has been released publicly as well. So feel free to check that out. Um, and there's also, I think we we recently announced Inoki, which would be also useful for some of the commerce related uh, uh, cases there. I will also link the Inoki uh, website uh, at the chat as, as well as at the video description. Amazing, amazing. Any other question before we continue? Looks like we're good. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Now, I want to jump straight into the indexing story, but actually let's take a step back and actually see how we can publish the code we've just written. So assuming that we have the SWE CLI already installed, we can first try to see if our code builds. It should build, I hope. Um, I have the Swiss CLI. Let's go into the escrow folder. Then I can do a SWE move build. We can see that we just have a warning here. I guess we do not need that. All right, there we go. Now we built it. And then if we wanted to, can you still see my screen? Yeah, you can, yeah, you can, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we can. I just saw a weird uh, pop-up on my screen. That's why, <laughs> all right. Um, and now let's, actually publish it. I'm adding some gas budget here. 
So now what I did was that I just published the code. As you can see here, I hope it was successful. Let's see. Yeah, it was. Yep, we can we see that. Sorry. Yeah, we have another question here saying, uh, can we delete a shared object that has items inside? Um, it depends if the items, if anything that's wrapped in the shared object has drop, then yes. If not, we need to first uh, destroy individual objects. That's not the same case for dynamic fields. Uh, we could delete it and even if it had a few dynamic fields, we cannot actually protect from that. But as long as they are part of the actual object that we're destructuring, they need to either have drop, in that case, yes, we can, or do something with these objects. For instance, if on our shared object we had a table that was directly part of that object, we would need to first destroy the table and then be able to finish the transaction to destroy the wrapper object. I hope that answers the question. All right, so um, moving on, we just published the package. You can see it right here. And we see that our package ID is now this one. I It has two modules, the SQL and the log, the ones that we just created. Um, and if we open up an explorer, I will just use this one. We will not find it. Wait, what is the active network I have? It is on testnet. Let me use a different explorer. There we go. So now we can see that our package was published. And it has the types we have defined and all the different public functions. And an interesting comment about Polymedia not working for testnet. I'm almost certain I've used it on testnet, but maybe today there is something not being functional there. Anyways, now let me actually start moving towards the indexing side. Before I jump into this code we've just written and make it a little bit easier to work with, with the indexing type we're going to build, let me tell you the different types of indexing we can do, at least according to my so far knowledge. A, we have on the documentation, you can see that we have a custom indexer. This is this uses the data ingestion framework behind the scenes and it processes everything. So it goes through every checkpoint. And from there, we can write the code to actually pick what we want. The details for that are here, and I actually won't dive deep into that, but this is if we really care about real-time indexing and if we have to do some complex extraction of data from, um, that's for, from each checkpoint. So let me actually link you to that. Now, the type of indexing we will do in this demo is actually a little bit more naive on design. And what it does is it will essentially start polling the RPCs for events. So we will write some events, for instance, when we create a locked object or when we destroy a locked object or when a new escrow is created and we will have someone that watches the RPC if there are any new events. So every time there is a new escrow created event, for instance, we will actually index that escrow in our own database. That is what we're trying, we will build here. So 
let's start by by adding a few events. Let's start with the log module that we started with. Um, let me also import the event module from the Swift framework. Now, we need to define the event structure. Let's define it here. Let's say that we will create an event which, which is the log created. We will emit it when we are actually calling this function, when we are creating a log and wrapping an object in it. Let's say that we need the log ID, the key ID. We can easily do pairing of these locked objects um, from our indexer. Let's also keep the item ID so we can easily query the object that we have wrapped. And it could potentially add the creator, although that should also be part of the events when we fetch them. And let's also add an event for when we actually unlock it. So we know, so our service knows that this locked object is no longer available. We cannot actually use it. Um, and all we care about is the lock ID. We want to know that this locked object was indeed destroyed and it's not available anymore for usage in escrows. And now let's actually go ahead and emit these events. We can come here and emit one log created event. The log ID, we can get it from the log above. The key ID is the same. Creator is the center of the transaction. And the object ID is that of the object. So we just emitted this event. Now, every time this function is being called, this event will be emitted. Let's do the same for the unlock function or let Copilot do it for us. And I think that's pretty much all the events we need uh, for the log module. Now, let's go ahead and do something similar for our. We have another question here. Um, why don't we emit the function at the, uh, sorry, emit the event at the end of the function? It uh, does really matter. It's uh, this is all about aesthetics and how we like to write the code because every function anyways is all or nothing. Every transaction we're doing and we're building and every function we're calling is works in an all or nothing fashion. So it either does every step that's in the function or none. And I think something extra on this one. Um, for this particular case, because I'm actually adding the object um, as a dynamic object field, it would be a little bit trickier to actually extract the ID. I would either need to get the ID before I add it as a dynamic object field or borrow the dynamic object field to get the ID out of it. Which neither of these works for this case. It makes it simpler if we do it that way. Any follow-up question on that before I continue? Uh, I think we are good. I will also add some explanations there. Um... Awesome. Now, let's go back to our escrow creation module and add some events there as well. Again, here we will need to have an event emitted when an escrow is created. 
Copilot is a few steps ahead of me. It's already on the escrow console. And a little bit wrong, but it's fine. Let's also do the escrow created. Oh, and it forgot the abilities. Did it also forget them here? I didn't. All right. Now, when we create an escrow, we want to know the escrow ID, of course. We want to know for which key this escrow works. We want to know the recipient that we have defined. We want to know the item ID. And let's also add the sender, although here I think that we don't need that and we also need to update the guide because we can extract this information from the transaction data. But I will keep it just so we can follow the exact uh, guide now and update later on. Um, so we will need this event when we create an escrow. We will also need this event, nice, when we have actually done a swap, but we just need the escrow ID in that case, because if we think about how we save, how we index these events, we can imagine that we have our polling based index that we will build and we receive an escrow created event. The escrow swapped event will always be after the escrow created. So there is no reason to repeat all this information. We just need to know which escrow ID was swapped or which escrow ID was actually canceled. It's a good practice to avoid adding too much information because every event call also adds a little bit of a gas cost. So we want to be reasonable in the way we use data here. But there is not like a golden standard in this. It really depends on its application. So now let's go ahead and add the event in the create function. Let me just copy and paste it to save us some time. Let's also import the module. So we are emitting the escrow created event. We add the escrow ID, the key ID, send the recipient and the item ID. Then on the swap, let's also emit an event. Here we need the ID. We can use this ID. And convert it, convert this UID to an ID. UID is always unique, you cannot copy it, but um, ID, you can copy it. If we actually go on the definition, we will see that by passing a reference to UID, we can actually get an ID by value. Because if you go to the struct definition, we see that the ID has copy, store, and drop. That means that we can copy it, we can drop it. So in the previous question about whether we can drop, for instance, a shared object and delete it, like that, if it had an ID stored, it has dropped, so we can do it without worrying extra. But for the UID here, we see that it only has store. So we cannot copy it nor drop it. We added the event for the swap case and let's uncomment this escrow canceled um, event. So with this addition right now, we have all the events in place. Um, and um, we can use these events and index them so we can serve our front end later on. Let's do another build to make sure that we did write the code correctly. And let's, let's publish it. I will 
keep this tab open so we can actually use this package ID later on when we start doing the indexing. So now we're in the project. Let's actually create, let's start scaffolding our indexer. For this case, as we said, we're going with the TypeScript event-based indexer. Um, I will, for that, we will, of course, need to, to pull an RPC endpoint to get the events. We will also need a database uh, to save these events. In this example, we'll use Prisma, which is an ORM and database uh, connector for um, TypeScript. And for the database engine, in this demo, we'll use SQLite um, because it's easy to use in this context. Um, so let's start by firing up a TypeScript project. We can, oh wait, let's create a folder before we do that. Um, now let's do the same again. Let's init the TypeScript project. Nice. Let's start installing some dependencies. For this, we will need the main SWE SDK, like the TypeScript SDK for SWE. We will also need Prisma client. Let's also add some dev dependencies. We will need PS node to be to easily call these functions. We will need Prisma. And let's add the node types as well. Um, yeah, one moment. Let me correct this a little bit because I started the project outside. So let me open here and actually move all of this inside my indexer folder. Awesome, and I will use this terminal from now on. Now let's initialize Prisma that will um, create the Prisma folder, the initial schema, um, and the provider for the database. Let's use SQLite. Now here we have the schema um, for Prisma. Let's actually change um, the URL. Let's not use the end files for now. Let's make it quick. We will save the entire database in a file. We can name it dev.database. And let's start defining our data models. This will be the data that we will be indexing using this uh, TypeScript indexer. So let's start with the locked objects. Let's define the locked model. It's an integer. It's the primary key and it's um, auto incrementing. Let's save the object ID, which is unique. I'm just adding that so it can create. Um, it usually for many database engines, it will create an index. Let's save the key ID, it can be optional. The creator it can be optional. These fields are all part of the events that we need before. So if we go to the lock um, module before, we can see that we are saving all these fields that I'm creating right now. We can see that on the lock created, we have the um, lock ID, key ID, item ID, and creator. And here we're doing something similar. The object ID is the lock ID. We have the key ID, we have the creator. We also need the item ID. 
And uh, let's also keep a flag if a log has been deleted. We can also decide to remove them completely from the database, but for now we will just keep everything. Let's say that we keep all historical data. Can you increase the front, uh, font size a little bit? Yeah. You, you are so right. Sorry for that. I opened a new uh, window. So that would be our locked model. That's how we would save our locked objects in our indexing database. Let's now also model the escrow objects again here if we open the contract and we go here we have the escrow created we can see the fields that we essentially want want to save i'm just pasting them like that so we follow the structure give or take again we need an id i think it created everything for me that's nice. Let's also add the swapped flag and if I'm not mistaken, it has every field we need. So nice. Again, copilot did the work for me. Um, and the next thing we will actually need now think the way the indexer is built is that it pulls the RPC and it gets some events. As we understand, these events are saved paginated, so we could have multiple pages of events. So a way for us to only look forward and avoid having to go through the entire history of events is that we can save the state we were on and we can continue from that state the next time we actually start our indexer so we don't have to go through historical data. That's the one reason. And the second reason is that events by on the nature are ephemeral, so we cannot trust that these events will always and forever be available by the RPCs. So let's also keep the cursor, a cursor model, so we can save in the database. Um, the idea of an event is actually the event sequence and the digest of the transaction. So I will save these fields and we will see them later as we start actually building an indexer and start um to populate this database now that we have our models in place let's actually um let's actually do the migration so we can um we can create the schema um on the sql lib file that will be created we will type this command, which is the migrate dev, and that will also create a migration file here. There we go. So now if we open the migration file, we can see that it created all the SQL queries for our schema. And it also initialized the dev to database file. That's the database in that case for a more production grade application we would use another database engine like postgres or for sql databases or any mongo for non sql databases but we keep it simple here so now that we created the migrations let's also uh, prisma has a nice studio that we can also see the models that we have and any data we have here and we see that we actually did successfully we have the cursor which has the fields we expected. It has the escrow model, which again has all the fields we were expecting it to have. And the locked um, object, again, same story. So let's actually start writing some code to do this indexing. Let's create a folder name it indexer, and let's create the event indexer dot typesheet file. So the idea here is that um, we have two modules and we want to receive, listen to events for both of these modules. So there are different filters we can use when we're querying RPC endpoints. Um, 
For this case, because we care about the order of events emitted from a particular module, we will use the move event module filter. Let me elaborate a little bit further on that. And let me do some minor setups here to make sure that my coding would work as expected. Um, let me see that I have the correct autocomplete. Yeah, I do. You can see that I can see um, constructors and anything from the types of SDK. It gives me autocomplete. That's why I did this minor changes that we saw me doing. So let's create a small example on how it would look like for us without thinking about the entire index. So let's see how we would actually query some data. Um, some events from the RPC endpoint. Let's name it query. Let's create a new SUI client. Get full node URL. Let's do it for testnet. Now we have this SUI client, and if we actually want to query, let's try that. Let's do that. Let's do query SUI client dot query events. Now that's too generic. Let's also add some um, our filter. Um, one moment. Let's add our query, which will be a filter. Um, we will do the move event module. Uh, wait. Here, move event and module. There we go. I got the structure right. I'm sorry for this. We will define the package and the module. So before we did before we did that, we actually published the package. So in our case, if we want to see all the events emitted from our package that we published before, we would use this package ID. And for module, we would use either the lock module or the shared module. So we have these two different modules. Let me actually use a uh, package ID that has already been published and it has uh, some data so we can actually see this query in action. Um, let me use this one and use log. And let me just call this file. All right, now I just queried some events. The contract that has this event is identical to the one that we built in the previous hour. So now after doing this query, we can see events emitted by that package and the log module. We can see here that this is what we would expect. We can see like a log created um, type and more information for that event, like the module that emitted it and the timestamp. And if we actually do a more in-depth console log, and we run it again, we can actually also see, now let's look at this event here. We can see the ID, which is again, you remember before when we created our schema, it has a transaction digest and the event sequence number. Um, we can see this one is a lock destroyed event, and we can see that the, it has the lock ID as we defined it on our package. If we go here and uh, open this file, we can see that our lock destroyed. Um, sorry, one moment. We can see that our lock destroyed um, event type has the lock ID as it does as I create this data. And we can see that the lock created event, for instance, has the creator, the item ID, the key ID, and the lock ID. So all of this data is what we actually want to save in our database. Does that make sense until now? Is there any question I can answer?
Oh, I think we can proceed. <clears throat> awesome, awesome. I gave it a little bit of time because it might take a little while to type the question. All right, so let's actually see an example with the shared um, module as well. We can see again here that we're getting, wait, uh, yeah, here we can see we're getting like the escrow created events. Uh, and just two of these, to be fair, in this scenario. Now, uh, for JSON RPC that we're using in this example, the pagination limit is 50 um, events per page. GraphQL limits, I'm not entirely certain right now, but we can look at the docs later and see it. Now, let me limit it to one since we had two events here. And we can see that in the result, we have the next cursor in the pagination and whether it has a next page or not. That way we know that when it has a next page, we can actually continue querying for events. Now that we had two events in total and we have a limit of one, we can assume that there would be a second page and, that is, and that's it. So let's now try to model this a little bit better so we can actually start indexing this event and saving them in our database. I will copy some existing code so we don't have to um, spend a lot of time trying to write it, but let me do it. Let me import some types and I will start explaining the code I just pasted. Let me also define the config object directly. Um, Let's use this package ID here. So I will just change the code a tiny bit. And then I will explain what, what the code I'm just writing does. Wait, sorry. All right. All right, so the way we are modeling this is that, as we understand, we would need to do polling for two different queries. We want all the events emitted from the lock module, and we also want all the events emitted from the shared module. If we think about that in terms of design, we can think of them like having different event trackers. Here, each tracker can have a type and it can have a filter. The filter would be a move event module, as we said before. You can see on the documentation all the different available filters. Um, and a callback function. That would actually be our handler. The handler that would actually take these events and save the results in the database. I built, we built it in such a way so that um, for each of these different events we're tracking, we can define a custom handler and we can reuse a lot of the code. Let's create um, the actual execution job. I will again copy it over from the existing example to save a little bit of time. Now we can see here on the events to track that we save that we have the log again, as I said before, which has the package ID from the config and the module log and a callback that we will define later on. We can keep the errors for now. And we have the shared module as a second type. Now, if we actually try to create an execution job for that, we would need the client to actually do the query. An event tracker, um, this is that type, like um, its particular one. And then we can start getting the events. So for example, here we can see that we are getting the data, whether it has a next page or not, and the next case or the next, how we go to the next page. The query for that would be defined on our tracker here. So for each case, it would be different whenever we call this. The callback is the function that we will define um, 
for each uh, query that we're tracking. And if there is indeed a next page after we are waiting for the handler to do its job, we will also save the next cursor so we ignore all the events from that point and before. Let's and let's also save um, the save latest cursor uh, function so we can see it. Let me do some input, inputs here. All right, let's ignore this for now. It's type should not detect in Prisma. But we can skip it for now. We can assume that this is Prismas. I think that if I start my code editor, this will start working properly. All right, one moment. Let me figure this out. Oh yeah, of course. It won't work until I actually create the file for the database. I'm sorry for that. Let me actually create a type a file for the database and actually export Prisma for us to use in this example. So now I did the connection. This is the Prisma ORM. I can now run different queries to the database. So in this case, we can actually, for the save latest cursor, what we're doing is we're actually doing an upsert. We find we have a type that we saved in our event tracker. We have like, for instance, the log type or the cert uh, type and Every time we actually have a new page and we want to save the new cursor, we can actually call the save latest cursor function, which will save the latest state of that. It's uh, it's like an insert and update on conflict query that's being created here. If the type already exists in the database, it will replace with the latest cursor that we're passing over here. So you can imagine that if we wanted to actually restart the process from the start, we could go ahead in the cursor. Um, database empty it and that would start our indexer from the beginning again of history as long as the data are available so now we created the save latest cursor we have the execution job that will be running in uh, we haven't defined how it will run but we will be calling that uh, on a polling interval that we will define in a little bit let's um, do it right here actually Poll interval. Let's say that it, we will poll every second. That's in milliseconds here. Um, and let's actually start calling this execution job so it starts making a little bit more sense what we're doing over here. So if we look at this code, let me zoom in again. If we look at um, this code, we can see that when we run an event job, we want a client that we can reuse. We want a tracker. The tracker again is the type that we defined that has the filter and the callback. And we want the cursor. We want the cursor that we want to start from. So when we initialize the process, the cursor would be the latest state saved on our database. Or if we haven't saved anything on the database, we would start from scratch. We would start from the oldest um, data that we have. So now, Let's actually call this run event job. This event job will then go into the execution that we defined before, and it will try to get the next events in line from that cursor and forward. And it will also save the latest cursor um, if there was an extra page. And then what it will also do is that it will set a timeout. So every one second as we define it right now or if it has an next page already so we can like skip the wait if we know that we have a few pages ahead of us it will run the event job again so that's 
calling itself to continue on from the beginning and do the same thing, but going forward because the actual execution is saving the next cursor. If we have no data, the, the next cursor would be the same. So we would just fall again uh, until we get some new events coming in. And now let's actually call this for the different events we want to track. We have a few events that we want to track. So we will create a function that sets up these listeners. Here we can create the client for now. We don't have these helpers. We can use this client here. And what we haven't actually implemented is getting the latest cursor from the database when we begin. So the setup listeners would be the first thing we would call when we initialize our indexer. We would construct a client. We would go over all the events we want to track, all the different, not events, but categories, different filters of events, like the lock module or the cert module. And for each one of those, we would begin this loop of trying to get new events and poll uh, continuously. There is nothing that actually makes this uh, program exit. And when we begin, we also need to get the latest cursor from the database. Let me also add this piece of code here. That would go into the uh, database and look up for this particular tracker type that we have defined. And if we find it, we will return it. Otherwise, we return undefined. And that means that our indexing begins from the start of time, since these are used, since these are ordered in the ascending uh, format. So they start from the past to the future. So that would be our main loop. That would be our abstracted indexer right here. It can accept different types of events to track, and it will continue do, doing the polling. Now, what we need to do is actually create some handlers. What do we do this, with this event data? Like we know that this callback will be called when we have data and we will also know the type that called it. But what do we do with those? Of course, our goal here is to save the data in our database. Now, before I start building any of these trackers, do we have any questions? I think we're also a little bit over time, so. Oh, we are. Yeah. I think right now the <laughs> not not many people are uh, viewing this right now. So. What would be the ideal uh, course of action here? So we. I think we, we can uh, we can probably do. Do you have like a full indexer, um, kind of run, like written up or? Yeah, 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 we do have that. So we like demonstrate that. See. All right, let's actually see a handler. Let me bring that window here. All right, one moment. All right. So we were here, we were setting up the different trackers, and we can see that we can have multiple callbacks. Now let's look, for instance, how we handle the lock objects, how we handle indexing those locked objects. We can see that we receive an array of different SU events. These are the events that we saw before on the terminal. And for each of those events, we can start parsing the data. And what we do here is actually, I don't wanna dive like straight in lines of code, but what it does is that for each of these events, we're actually starting to collecting the data in bulk. So we get 50 of these entries in bulk. And depending on the case, if it's a deletion or a swap, here we only have deletion, we don't have swaps uh, for the lock object. We can actually also save that. That's why we had a flag in our database. And then what it does is that it just does a bulk insertion of all the different data in our database. And um, once 
it finishes that, then the polling can continue going to the next page or if there's no next page, wait for the next events to come in. I think that wraps up how the indexer works. Yep, so for those of you all that are still here with us, uh, thank you very much. Well, any questions here? Well, and I answer them uh, for the next five or six minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> if not, I think we'll just uh, hang out and uh, end the stream at, like, I would say 8.30 uh, my time or in, like, seven minutes or so. Okay, well, Josh talks crypto. Thank you very much. He stayed through the entire talk. Um, nice. <laughs> it was a long one, but... I actually encourage uh, anyone watching that to also go on the documentation and try to rebuild this example because that will give a better idea. It's one thing to see someone building that and it's another to actually try and do it. And the more you practice on this, the more sense that we start making. I'm going to wait for another minute or so. Uh... What are the biggest gotchas for using Move? Let me think how I can answer that. Can you give an example? Like, what does a gotcha mean? Like, I'm not uh, sure I will answer this properly. <laughs> um, like, moments where you say, oh, um, I should have worried about that. Yeah, yeah, that's so the I think the mental leap until you understand that um, everything is an object and even like when we're writing contracts, the code is an object and we have different types of object ownership. For instance, um, we cannot mutate an object that's owned by an account unless it's an explicit action from the object owner. The true ownership of SWE and the object model, I would say, is the mindset shift that needs to happen before we understand how to write move. And actually, once we understand how objects interact and how we we build the access control for these objects and how we build different uh, ownership models for these objects um, with what's available, then um, it's all about until it clicks and we understand this object model. And that's a big differentiator from different things. Yeah, I think I will actually argue that uh, Solana's Rust versus uh, Sui's Move is actually more similar compared to Solidity, uh, whereas the the data is basically in Solidity land, um, stores the data in the smart contract, right? Whereas for, for Sui, the data is separate from the actual package, uh, which kind of brings an extra layer of security there as, as, as well as kind of more easy to reason with. And um, instead of, you know, if there's a hack in the smart contract, then all of your data is basically lost, which is the tokens, the assets. Uh, but uh, if there's a problem with the actual package, then you just upgrade the package. Then the the objects are kind of separate from uh, whatever the logic is happening. And the creator does not have control over the object. That's really important. Right, like, right, absolutely. It's only the owner that has full control. Right, so once you own an object, you actually uh, Oh, no. It's just a different way of abstracting things, but it uh, makes things uh, safer uh, as a side effect, which is good. Right. And it also opens up the ability for more for account abstractions. And we say that an object can own other objects, as we saw. We can have dynamic fields, and we also have transfer to objects, where we can transfer objects directly to a different object. So we understand that even the account 
and how, what an account means here can be interpreted differently because we can have objects being accounts in a sense. Yep. So I think before we end the stream, uh, just a reminder that the SUI overflow is going to happen on April 21st. So three days from now, uh, be sure to sign up. Uh, you can also sign up like after the uh, event started or or anything. And then what, what you need to do is just go to uh, sui.io slash overflow to sign up. And we do have an official Discord as well uh, for you to kind of find teams and discuss projects, ideas uh, for the hackathon. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you all there at uh, the Overflow Hackathon. Well, yeah. well thank you very much, Manos, for joining us. Uh, thank you. And, thank you very uh, much. See you in the future. Bye. Bye, everyone.